Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? How's it going? Is it clear? Not choppy? Okay, wonderful. All right, um, then I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Harcourt. I work as an education consultant uh, here in Miami, Florida, where I cover um, the southeastern part of the United States. Um, and I'm, you know, really thinking about all these wonderful places I would love to visit, seeing where you all are typing in from. So that's that's really nice. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Catherine, Gisub, um, and Josedek for all they've done. Uh, to help put this conference together. I think we've had a great week so far. Um, and also make sure you're checking out the social media challenges. We still have some of those going on. Um, so please feel free to go check out our Twitter page. All right, so in this session, we're gonna take a look at what digital resources go with the OPD? The OPD is the Oxford Picture Dictionary. Uh, and then for the majority of the session, we're gonna look at how we can tailor or tweak some lessons using the OPD third edition to our current uh, virtual teaching context um, and round it out with some conclusions. Um, so to get started, um, I want to see if we could maybe get a poll. Uh, if we have a poll, if not, maybe we can type it out in the chat. After uh, this week of, of camp, um, how confident do you feel in teaching uh, your lessons these days? Or, or after um, you know attending this week of session, how confident are you in teaching online? So I think this poll should be coming up and feel free to Turn out after after having a week filled with sessions, uh, collaborating with colleagues. How do you, how do you, I want to take a pulse check and see how we're feeling? Okay, the results are coming in. It's looking like mainly somewhat confident, a lot of confident, not too many terrified. Terrified are actually going down. That's interesting, and not too many. It's a breeze. I would love to hear from the people who say it's a breeze. I think they should be leading the session. Okay, so somewhat confident. That's actually a lot better than uh, than I would imagine. Um, so I think that you know you've had probably had some experience uh, teaching online so far, um, and then I think this week has been really helpful uh, in building community and figuring out what other teachers are doing around the world. Um, and that's really going to be the majority of our session. Um, we're going to think of this kind of as a brainstorming lesson planning session. Um, so yes, I'll go over the OPD a little bit and show you some resources, but I think um, we're going to get the most out of each other um, and figure out how we might do things differently. So why are we looking at a soccer goal or a football goal? Uh, well, in preparing for this session, I was thinking a lot about this notion of goals versus expectations um, and managing expectations. Uh, you know, this idea of what we want to happen, where we want to take our learners versus how, we, how we're going to get there. Um, and right now, teachers have a lot of obstacles, defenders, if you will, that we're going up against um, in helping our learners achieve our goal. Um, but I think it's important. Uh, and, and what I've been really encouraged by through my conversations with teachers um, is that their goals consistently remain the same as, as this quote says, my goal is for my learners to meet theirs. Um, so this comes from the College and Career Readiness Skills Builder Handbook, um, which is in the OPD Teacher Resource Center. Um, and I'll go over a little bit about where you can find these things, but this is a professional development resource. And I just really like this, this quote here because that's uh, what I hear from most teachers, um, you know, definitely a passionate group of people. Um, so my goal is for this session is to help you in that pursuit of helping learners meet their goals um, and recognizing that, yes, there will be some challenges, but we still want to make sure we're um, helping set our learners up for success. 
So um, this book and my teaching background are, are mainly adult learners in the United States, uh, but I recognize we have teachers all around the world. Um, so we're not, it's not going to be just for uh, adult learners in the U.S. I think many of the themes can be applied to other teaching contexts. So I want to see if we can get a poll going of what defines your student population in, in terms of average age range so that I can get an idea before we get started. Do we have that poll on the age range of your learners? Okay, so far I see under 18 a lot. And I understand under 18, you know, that could be primary, secondary. There are a lot of uh, variations under that. But there are some 18 to 25, so probably university level. Okay, all right, so I think that's good for the poll. We're seeing mainly under 18. Um, and I, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, I'd encourage you to stay with us because the OPD, the Picture Dictionary, is used in the United States. I know for uh, people I work with um, in K through 12 or otherwise primary programs, it's used as a supplement in university programs and then also in adult education programs. Um, so I want to kind of orient you a little bit uh, to the, this adult population um, that I'm talking about. So the theme for a long time was in working with adult learners uh, to help prepare them for life skills. So being able to uh, navigate the grocery store, uh, find housing, these, these basic sorts of things. And I have it in quotation marks because um, we've kind of moved past life skills as a term um, and narrowed it down to some more concrete things. So. Uh, helping set students up for post-secondary education, career training for family sustaining jobs, community and civic engagement or citizenship. Um, so th those are the main goals in teaching adult learners in the United States. Um, so just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview for anyone that's joining uh, around the world. So here is a little bit about the Oxford Dictionary 3rd Edition. Um, there are 12 units uh, over 4,000 words, 421 verbs, and practice activities. You can see these 12 units uh, on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. It focuses on the Oxford 3000 vocabulary list. Um, the Oxford 3000 is a corpus of 3,000 keywords which have been carefully selected. Uh, by a group of language experts and experienced teachers um, as the words which should receive priority in vocabulary teaching um, because of their importance and usefulness. The series director is Jamie Adelson Goldstein and Norma Shapiro. And I want to share with you uh, part of a quote from Jamie about uh, her plans in designing and designing and the use for the OPD. So about the OPD, she writes, it's flexible sequencing, variety of topics, and visual presentation make it a versatile resource. While it's true that we have access to millions of images at the click of a mouse, the internet can be an unpredictable resource. An ESL picture dictionary, such as OPD, however, has been carefully developed to serve adult English language learners by depicting high frequency and essential words within more than 80 thematic contexts that are pertinent to learners' goals and interests. Um, we have Expanded the workplace preparation topics. Um, there's meaningful more meaningful communicative practice. Uh, the third edition is way more of a, a complete course program rather than just a referential dictionary. There are new smartphone research tasks and a focus on brand new digital, financial, and health topics that students need uh, for success in the 21st century. Um, and some of these new and expanded topics include job search, career planning, soft skills, first day on the job, inside a company, digital literacy, information technology, cyber safety, internet research, health insurance, illness, and medical conditions. So what we're going to be doing in our lesson planning strategy today is 
looking at the pretending that we're working with the OPD student ebook. Um, so I just want to share with you a little bit of information. So it can be used uh, with a desktop, laptop, or tablet via Oxford Learners Bookshelf. Um, you can purchase an access code, um, and it's available that way. Embedded dictionary audio and voice record tool all for listening and pronunciation practice. And then there are fill-in forms on the page uh, with true-to-life context for students to practice new vocabulary. And additional practice activities are embedded. Um, so these are like embedded worksheets uh, to support multi-level listening, pronunciation, and grammar. Uh, the focus on multi-level activities is really important in the OPD, uh, along with Step Forward, if you were able to attend that session. Um, and basically what this means is I have not been able to really uh, find, I've never heard of a class that is really only one level. Of course, you have certain levels that you teach, but even within that level, there are going to be some learners operating at a little bit higher and some learners that are working to catch up. So we, we've created ways to differentiate and support uh, multi-level classes. And then for the teachers, we have the Teacher Resource Center. So you can purchase an access code uh, for lifetime access. Uh, it's a collection of downloadable resources that support the OPD program. Here's a list of those on the right-hand side. I'm not going to read these all out, but you can see there's a plethora. There's a ton of stuff. We really say you'll never be able to teach all of it, but that's kind of the point. It's just there to support you, um, and you can pull what you need and take. Um, really customize your instruction. But the great thing about it is it's really easy to search and find what you need. So you can browse by topic, uh, browse by resource, or search exactly for uh, what you're trying, trying to find. So now let's move into the core part of our uh, session. Like I said, this I'm going to treat this as if we're uh, doing a workshop, brainstorming, and uh, lesson planning. So I want to lesson plan with you. Um, so this is the page that we're gonna that we would need to teach, uh, mainly on the right, uh, left hand side here. Sorry, where it says personal information, um, and I'm gonna make this bigger. Don't worry, um, but I just wanted to orient you to what it would look like in the ebook. Um, so this would be the the page in the student ebook. Now let's go to our lesson plan, which we would uh, obtain from the Teacher Resource Center. This is the uh, just a, a snapshot of the, the top part of the lesson plan. Um, we have the communicative objectives here. Um, because it's really important, uh, learners want to know what they're working on and what they'll be able to achieve at the end of the lesson. Um, so like we've kind of started out with this theme of goals. Um, in multi-level instruction. So uh, these diamonds here, the one at the top on the left-hand side, the left diamond, that's basically if you know you have some students in the class that are struggling, as long as they can respond to personal information questions and complete a personal information form, that will be measurable success um, at the end of the lesson. Now these, the middle diamond and right diamond are the main objectives for everyone. Um, or for on-level students or higher-level students. And then these CASAS competencies, for anyone teaching in the U.S., you're familiar with these. Uh, for anyone abroad, this is a basically a benchmark measurement system and reporting system that uh, programs use. Um, these are essential skills and um, strengths that you want to build for your students. So this is just showing you which of those you'd be meeting. Um, by going through this lesson. So this is the teaching methodology that the uh, lesson plans were designed with. And actually, it's a, there's actually a little bit more than even this. Um, so this is the 3P teaching methodology, but it's also been referred to as the WPIA, so W-P-I-A, where you have warm-up, presentation, introduction, practice, uh, production, and then application. But essentially, 
it's present. You want to present the material, have some guided practice with, with you as the teacher, then some individual and team paired practice, moving into production, um, and then evaluation. Um, and you want to, I, I underline the evaluation because you want to evaluate and kind of assess learner's progress all along the way. So as a show of hands, how many of you use a teaching methodology like this or use this, this methodology? Or maybe just, yeah, you can just say yes, I guess. You do, okay. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. What do you think the benefit is? Anybody have an idea? Well, okay, yes, somebody has mentioned flows. And I think that's essentially it. You want to, you're introducing a new concept um, and you want to warm and prepare teachers uh, for that. I mean, sorry, you want to prepare students for that. Um, not throw everything at them at once. So you want to have the warm-up, presentation, introduction, but then you want to have plenty of opportunity for practice um, and for the students to work together um, and then evaluate at the end. So a lot of support, a lot of, and, but mainly with this, this idea of flow. So now let's go back to this next slide is going to be from the lesson plan. Uh, this says warm up dictate several phone numbers and ask volunteers to write them on the board. Okay, so um, already I'm thinking about something. If we're teaching online, there are already some kind of hiccups here. This is go we're going to have to tweak this. Like I said, we're going to treat this session as a, a brainstorming lesson plan. So first off, we've got to consider uh, volunteers are not going to be able to walk up to the board and write them. You know, let's imagine we're teaching online. Um, so, what do, first I want to ask, what does a warm-up look like in your current classes teaching online? How do you warm, warm students up and prepare them for, for the lesson? Start with a question, sometimes a game. Routine, games, questions, surprise them, get them to do exercises. I like that idea a lot. Questions or games? Jokes. Yes, that's good. I've heard of some people starting with idioms. Um, so, you know, writing something like once in a blue moon on the board and then having students try to figure it out. Okay, so yeah, I like all these ideas. Um, but if I think back to this idea of managing expectations and the challenges of teaching online, the warm up can be a point of, uh, you know, a stumbling block in some ways because you're not with all the students. Um, you're not able to help them get online and get connected, um, get everyone, uh, you know, connected to your class. So it's important to. Make sure that you don't get hung up in the warm up um, and that you're able to move forward with the flow of the lesson. So, my idea uh, for this, and I want to ask you to share what yours might be, but the one idea will be to start out as, you know, within the first few minutes of getting everyone connected to the Zoom class, go ahead and start saying some phone numbers 91975, et cetera. And then have students type in the chat box the phone number. So I would say out a phone number, and then I want to have students type it out in the chat. That way, I know I'm, I'm working on two things there. I know that the students can hear me, and then I know that students um, were actually working on some listening comprehension with a realistic um, scenario. So now let's look at. Um, the presentation part of this. Write the words, say, spell, print, and sign on the board. Demonstrate each verb with your own name. Call on volunteers to do the same. Okay, so um, this, fortunately here, we don't have to do much more um, than making sure we have a way to write these words out. So whether that's sharing your screen and bringing up a Word document, 
Somebody mentioned that Zoom has a whiteboard. That would be a good way to do this, um, to write these, these vocabulary terms out that we'll be needing for the lesson. Say, spell, and print. And demonstrate each verb with your own name. Um, so I want to ask you, for this presentation part, how might you deliver these vocabulary terms that we'll need for the lesson? You, uh, Google Doc, yes, that, that's an idea that if nobody else said it, I was going to say. Good. Google Docs and ask volunteers to type. Yes, that's a great way. A Google Doc would work really well because you can have multiple people collaborating and then you can have them, you could start out by typing your name and then you can ask different volunteers to uh, type out a similar sentence with their own name. And it's a way to call on volunteers. And essentially, they're really just walking up to the board. They're, they're typing into the, the Google Doc. So um, let's move forward. So now we want to have the students open up the actual book. So we've presented some key vocabulary that will be necessary, and um, we've, we've warmed up students up. So I I'm already I'm really liking the responses you are, are offering. So now let's look at this part. We want to have students open up the OPD to page four. Use the pictures to talk about Carlos Soto. So let's bring those pictures up. Um, so first, I want to ask you, this is a kind of a question I have uh, learned from Jamie, the series director, that is good to use for students. Um, so what I might do is ask the students these questions. What do you see? What do you notice? What does it make you think about? And so, yeah, I'll ask you, I'll basically type in the chat, what do you see and what does it make you think of as, from a teacher's perspective? Travel. Communication sequencing. Personal info. I order questions. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of travel. Communication. Actually, this is great because what you all have shared is different than what I thought. But that's the great thing about the OPD. Not to be, not to have a cliche, but you know, sometimes, in, especially in an ESL classroom, having pictures can really be worth um, maybe not a thousand words because we're working on building that vocabulary for students. But it, you'll be amazed how many different interpretations students will have just by looking at the same picture. Um, so what I might do is I would notice and I could try to call on students and ask them um, what they think. But what I see if I was trying to, if you know, I wasn't getting much out of the students, I might start out by saying, um, so, Joe, what do you notice about picture seven and eight? Oh, well, that's Tampa, Florida. That's that's where Carlos lives. I was like, oh, well, how do, how do you know that? Um, well, you can see on the letter that that's Carlos's address on picture number nine. Okay, well, what about picture 15? Oh, that's Costa Rica. That's where Carlos was born, in San Jose. All right, so somebody's picking up on it. Carlos is from Florida. And then you can start to move into um, some of these other uh, pictures here. Um, so we're looking at a social security card, which is essential um, in the United States. Picture 14, that might be a good question. What, is, what does that represent? To me, that represents uh, when Carlos was born. Um, but there's another picture next to that. It's a calendar. So the calendar, yeah, somebody typed calendar. So that might be something, a vocabulary term we might, might need to spell out for our students. Okay, so 
that's this is another good warm up and also a way to introduce some key vocabulary. Um, and I think you'll find by using pictures like these that are well sequenced um, and connected to a, a concrete theme that you can um, elicit a lot more from your students than you might expect. But also, more imp importantly, you're going to get many different responses. And one thing I also would point out is all these different numbers, when you click on them in the ebook, it's going to play the audio. It's going to pronounce that word for you. Um, and then students could, could record themselves next to that uh, to compare. OK, so I haven't seen any uh, objections so far, which I'm surprised. But when you think about this presentation for part two, have students open the OPD to page four. I, I would say that's a lot simpler than, uh, than it sounds. So, you know, if you want to have, if you're working in a Zoom class and you want to have your students go to their book in a new screen, that's not always so easy, um, especially when we're all teaching online and you're not with them. So we've tried to make it easier for students to uh, find the page that they'll need for this activity. And if you use any ebooks on Oxford Learners Bookshelf, you may have noticed this um, recently. Has anybody noticed this icon or know what this is? It's a link. Yep, exactly. So before the lesson, uh, you could send out this link. You just press, uh, click this when you're lesson planning and you're on page four, for instance. Send it out to your class via email, via Google Classroom, or type it in the chat in Zoom while you're meeting and have them click on it. Um, and that's going to save you time and make it easier for students because it's going to go straight to the page you need uh, for your lesson. So any, any little things like that we can try to do to uh, simplify the process is, is helpful. So now let's move forward um, to the guided practice part. So copy the sample conversation from the bottom of page four bottom of page four on the board, leaving blanks for personal information. So um, on the bottom of all the pages in the picture dictionary, we have either activities uh, or point of use grammar, um, uh, grammar notes signposted that students would need. Uh, for instance, on the next page for school, it's the difference between um, is and are. Um, so for this one, you would want to copy the conversation. Here, my name is Carlos. Please spell Carlos for me. Um, and basically, I think from what you've, uh, I think we're all on the same page that it wouldn't be too hard to open up a Google Doc, basically. And um, yeah, type out this. My name is Carlos. Please spell Carlos for me. And then what I, well, first, let me ask you how much you work with this. If you, if you have this as an introduction example and you want to work on, work on spelling, what would you give next? What sort of activity, how much you do an activity to work on spelling, knowing that we're teaching online? Show images of things they know. OK, so one, Hangman Scrabble, that's a great idea. Yes, because Hangman, naturally, you have to spell correctly. That's a good idea. Yes. OK, so I, I really like, OK, Spelling Bee, a good idea. All right, yeah, so I like these ideas. Um, I think you all have some better ideas, but mine was going to be, um, we don't often focus on spelling proper nouns correctly, but I think it's important, especially for uh, names that are pretty common. Um, so that varies depending on where you live. But I would, I would speak out, I would dictate some names, not the ones that are, not any students in the class, because if you're on Zoom, people will probably be able to just read out the students' names. So I would 
come up with some other names, common names, um, and then ask students to spell those in the chat. But actually, better yet, I like the idea of, of um, Hangman. All right. So I think we're doing really well with tweaking our lesson for an online context so far. Um, so this next part, it says to elicit other personal information to use in the conversations, to protect students' privacy, write a fake social security number, and the school's address and phone number on the board. Um, so what we're looking at this picture is the fill-in form on this page. So when you click on it, you can type your answers in. Um, and when you close the book, they'll be saved there. So you might not want um, students, uh, and this can be a good practical life, um, life information for the students, that they might not want to type their actual information in here, um, even though it is saved and, and secure. It's always good to um, have maybe not, sh not have that information floating online. Um, so what we're trying to do is build some information, uh, real source information to use in the next activity. Um, but also students are getting real world practice of filling in a form. Um, so what I want to know here is how would you um, assess that your students have done this correctly, that they filled in their form? So they're, they're going to the page in the OPD ebook. They're typing in their answers with the fake social security number and everything. Okay, so your correction. Yeah. So one idea. Uh, and I think what we're looking at here, especially for adult learners, um, our adult learners in the United States are, you know, very much focused on uh, improving their economic situation and um, or working towards some post-secondary education. So building digital literacy skills is essential. And this form is giving them real world practice in basically a sheltered and safe way to practice this. So one other digital literacy skill you could introduce um, would be showing students how to take screenshots and then have them take a screenshot of this form and email it to you. So that was just my idea. Um, how can you correct, peer correct if the info will be fake? So the info would be info you would, give, you would have given them. So there, it would be the same info, and you want to make sure that um, they uh, understood correctly. All right. So let's take a look back at the full page. Let's go back to our, our page in the ebook here. Um, so you see here on the left-hand side, that was our paired practice. That's what we worked on a little bit ago. Um, we've basically done most of this on the page. Now, for the second activity, um, we have an internet research popular names activity. So let's take a look at that. This is coming from the lesson plan, which you see here. Then this is the task. Um, so this inter these internet research activities were something we added in the third edition of the OPD, and have actually really come in handy now that we're teaching online. I think it's actually a way to make the most of teaching online. It's a bit easier to do if you're in a virtual class. Um, so this uh, basically says direct students to read the instructions at the bottom of the page here, uh, listed the search terms they read, and write them on the board. Uh, so search bar, um, report, list, some of those search terms, write them on the board to define them. Ask students if they know what SSA stands for. Ask them to look for the answer on page four and write Social Security Administration. So that's an example. We're preparing students to do this activity. But basically, what we want to do here is make the most of teaching online and have students actually, either for homework or during class, 
go type in the search bar SSA top names 100 years. And so that's going to come up with some information. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically, the, as a teacher, you can figure out what questions you want them to go uh, to answer by looking up that information. Um, but how would you, you know, if we wanted to do this in a paired communicative practice activity, how might you, okay, somebody actually beat me to it, yeah. So if you wanted to have students pair up and go do this, how might you do it? I recently did a, worked on a session um, for a, a school, and we had a Zoom session all day, and then there were different breakout rooms. So I think that would be a great way. You can set students up with breakout rooms and um, have them go work on these. Periodically, go check back and make sure that um, students are on task and understanding what they're doing. But yeah, that's a great idea. And so I want to ask you, what else might you have students go look for uh, if, if you want to work with some real world data? Um, what questions might you ask or what might you ask them to search for? What would be level appropriate for your learners? The bank or the library. Tax administration office. Community phone numbers. Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, that would be a great way as well to um, support the higher level learners, maybe give them another challenge. Refugees often have little education and no computer skills. Yes, um, so I know, I know that that can be the case oftentimes and what we're trying to do here is work with very basic and low level information and build those skills. So those students, you might wanna work with them directly Doctor's office phone numbers. COVID information, yes. Unfortunately, that's not um, going to be the most pleasant topic, but it is pretty essential um, to know where the cases are going up. That's definitely an idea I had. And we have a lot of sections in the picture dictionary that go over uh, medical um, illnesses, um, navigating a doctor, a pharmacy. Yes. Okay. Zip codes. Free community services. Yes. Great ideas. All right, let's uh, move forward here. And finally, we've gotten to the evaluation piece. Okay, have students close their books and number in their notebooks from one to 10. Ask questions and give instructions. Uh, number one, and just to remind everyone, what we're looking at here comes from the lesson plan. Only you would see this. You would be getting this from the Teacher Resource Center. Um, so the students wouldn't see this. But um, it says, have students close their books and number in their notebooks from 1 to 10. Ask questions and give instructions. Number one, what's your last name? Number two, print your first name. So as you know, I've just picked a couple of different activities from this uh, unit for personal information. There's a lot more that you can do, but at this point, we would want to evaluate and, and check learners' knowledge on their ability to use personal information or to talk about themselves, ask people other personal information, um, and so now let's evaluate it. Um, so I think this would be pretty easy to customize by simply asking students to send you an email. Um, you could, you know, send this out via class communication and have them report back. Are there any other uh, creative ideas that you might add here? Work in pairs to create a dot, create dialogue. 
checking understanding. They could interview each other asking these questions. Yes, that's a good idea. So if you wanted, if you had the time and ability to actually use the evaluation piece to set up breakout rooms um, and have students interact in a conversation by asking these questions of each other, you would be accomplishing or you'd be assessing more than just their ability to read and write and respond to personal information, but also their, their speaking ability, pronunciation, um, and that sort of thing. So that's a good idea. Yeah, they can also record themselves. OK. So for the other piece in the, um, in the evaluation piece, uh, this, that's kind of what one of the suggestions was. Um, have students complete a partner's personal information form. Direct them to ask their partners for the information. Uh, listen to the responses and write the information on the form. Monitor and note areas where students need practice. Um, so I think this presents a little bit of a challenge, but like some people have said, if you have the ability to set up breakout rooms um, and work with your learners and follow, follow along, I think that would be a great way to do this um, for some assessment. Okay, there's a really good response here from Kate. I had my class and partners give their home address to their partner and use Google Maps to figure out how apart they live from each other. So that is a, an activity which is perf perfectly aligned with this unit of personal information and I think will be a great way. Um, giving directions is, is really a good idea because it's a real world essential activity and task. And you're also able to assess pronunciation, listening comprehension, and all of that. OK. So that's the evaluation. Finally, we would want to have some assessment. Um, fortunately, in the OPD Teacher Resource Center, you can find an assessment program. These are tests for every unit. These are Word documents, so the good thing is, is you can send these out over email. Um, of course, in a traditional class setting, you might print these out, but you send these out over email. But before you send them, you can actually customize them because they're in Word. Um, and you can elicit more information, ask some harder questions, or offer more support for learners who might, who might need it. And then you also you have the answers in the Teacher Resource Center as well. Um, so yeah, this is, if when I'm talking about the Teacher Resource Center, this is where you would find everything. So from a teacher's perspective, you've got your lesson plans, um, classic classroom activities. They're always different ones, depending on the activity. In this case, they're flashcards. So in a normal class setting, you would, um, have some flashcards or the images. You can actually print out large images of the pictures in the book as photocopyables. Um, and you can do kind of different scatter games, matching games with that, um, and play different activities like corners. Um, there are also videos here. There's the assessment program for teachers. And then I just want to point out the class audio, the videos, on all these worksheets at the bottom here, the great thing and why, what I actually really like about the ebook versus even print is all of those things are embedded and already plugged into the book. So normally in a traditional class setting, you might have to go print these out, find them, download the audio, etc. But all the audio is in the book, so you just click on it and it's going to play. Also. At the top, we have the video. So the video won't play so well over these Adobe presentations, but um, I'll describe it for you. And it's very similar. I think it would work really well with that idea of practicing giving information over Google Maps. Um, it supports that because in the video, it's about a minute long with uh, Carlos, um, our kind of main character for this unit, and another student, Mila. 
where they introduce themselves and ask how they spell their name. They're trying to figure out bus routes, so they ask each other what street the bus is on. Uh, this helps reinforce the vocabulary and provides another context for students to see a natural way to incorporate the language. The students also speak slowly, making it easily intelligible um, for uh, beginner learners. All right, so if we go back here. Does everyone see these? I know it's small, but this listening activity, one, two, and three. Can you see these one, two, and three? Um, what do you think that the one, two, and three indicate? Why are there three different listening activities? Levels. Right. So like I said, this is a way to support different um, or, or, you know, different levels within a certain level. Kind of really focus in and support um, learners wherever they are. So when you click on this one, two, or three, uh, which you could assign different groups of students, um, the diamonds indicate before level, on level, and then the three on the next page would be higher level. Um, so it's using the same information and content that everyone's looked at, but it, um, you know, is the, rigor, the rigor or how difficult it is to work with the vocabulary and terms is going to get harder as you move up. And these are also automatically checked and marked, which is helpful. Um, so then we have, yeah, this is just showing you the, the above level listening activity. And then finally, if you saw, we didn't go over the school section. It was on page five to the right, but there's a pronunciation activity. Um, and so this is helpful. Students can listen and discriminate between uh, or differentiate between the long A in grades, main, or make, and the short A. Uh, and or I uh, and ask lab track. This is a good uh, listening comprehension or pronunciation activity. Uh, so yeah, this is helping students build kind of a basis um, on the very beginning level of pronunciation. But then, like I said, whenever they're working through the ebook, they're able to play audio and then record themselves to compare. Um, another way to take this off of the the book. Somebody recommended to me recently um, to have students say something to Siri if they happen to have an iPhone, um, and that's a good way to see if they're they're checking how they check their content. But I have to say, sometimes Siri doesn't understand me, <laughs> so just uh, just a disclaimer. All right, so that is about. Um, most of my session, I've really in, in, I've uh, really um, enjoyed hearing your responses and everything. So let's just have some final thoughts to wrap up with. Uh, visuals, we know that visuals can support meaning across learner levels. And when you ask questions like, what do you see? What do you notice? It privileges everyone in the class and doesn't require prior knowledge because everyone's going to have different um, ideas and thoughts when they look at an image. Um, and like we said, uh, sometimes a picture can be worth a thousand words. And we want to get as many words, as much vocabulary from the students as possible. Finally, having reliable materials can help you when you need to customize instruction. So I know personally, um, if I had to just look at that page four in the book and come up with a lesson, I would be pretty hard pressed. I think it's it's really challenging to get creative. But if I'm able to look at the way someone else would do it, uh, what the OPD lesson plan is, I may not want to do everything that it does, but um, it helps me. It kind of I, I look at one activity or task and think, okay, here's where I would do that differently. So having some sort of template, I think, helps um, you be more creative. And there's been there have been so many creative ideas. Um, from the chat box, so I really appreciate that. And opportunities for student paired practice are crucial. 
Um, this cha the challenge of listening and speaking is really hard um, when teaching online, but I think these group virtual meetings can help um, as well as WhatsApp and some other ideas that you all have shared. So we have a little bit, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I think we wanted to end on time, or if not a little bit early, uh, because there was only 30 minutes before the next session. Um, but I have some questions, it looks like. So I'm going to get through these. And if you have any more questions right now, uh, please fire away. So, so should goals change when we move to online teaching from Maria? No, I don't think so. So that's the point uh, I was trying to make. Maybe it wasn't completely clear, but I was thinking about how our expectations and managing expectations may have to change. But our goals, um, you know, our goals really don't. We still want to get to a, a pay, uh, an objective for the students. Um, so I think I was just kind of talking about that difference between managing expectations while still trying to meet our goals. How is OPD different from a course book? So the OPD has print workbooks. Um, I didn't go over those because I'm thinking about teaching in an online setting, but um, it, it can be a course book uh, if you're using the workbooks, um, but it can also be a supporting material. What is multi-level listening? Um, so those, the multi-level listening activities we took a look at later. Uh, I think we went over those. So it's basically a support or reference book, isn't it? It's a little bit more than that, I think. Um, hopefully by the end of the session, you've seen how it can be used as an actual book for the basis of a lesson plan. Um, but it, of course, it could be a reference book. Does the student ebook work with mobile phones? Um, not currently. I think we're working on that for the future. But right now, it works on a computer um, or an iPad or, or tablet. How can I get access to OPD? Where can I get the dictionary? Yeah, people want to know where to get it. Um, so if you live in the southeastern United States, please get in contact with me. Um, if not, contact your local OUP education consultant. But also, but anybody, make sure you download some of these resources. I have the lesson plan we looked at here, um, the assessment, the test, and a lot of other there are a lot of, a lot of other resources here. What does CASAS mean? Um, CASAS is a U.S. Um, assessment um, program and monitoring system for adult education schools. Okay, should we say aim, goal, or objective in a lesson plan? Um, yes, uh, well, I think that's a personal thing. I'm not sure that I'm able to say exactly what you should say. I think it depends on your learning. Those are all kind of synonyms, aim, goal, or objective. Should there be a pre-assessment for background understanding? Yes. Um, so we're, we were looking at page four. Um, there's a lot of extra support in the first few pages. Um, and I kind of skipped around in the lesson plan. So if you download it, I think you'll see there are some opportunities to assess learners prior knowledge. Uh, OPD workbooks are not online currently. All right, I'm going to scroll down to the some re work my way up. Is the task applicable to all level students? So with 4,000 words and 80 thematic contexts, which fall under 12 different units, I think you'll be able to find some, some content and topics which will be applicable to all level students. Um, even if you're working with, as someone asked, college level students, there are pictures in here um, you know, if you're working with someone who wants to be an engineer, a biologist, or even an auto mechanic, there are some pictures which you can use to support vocabulary for those students, even if they're, you know, operating at a much higher level. Um, because we know that visuals can really support meaning across levels.
Okay. Um, so can you break a screen in two parts for classroom interaction and independent work? I think that depends on the class, the software you use, but I know with Zoom, you can set up individual breakout sessions and join those and, and, come, and then have everyone come back to a central one. How do you do this with students who can't type? Asking students to type questions. So that would be a challenge. Um, I think that's a good question and something maybe we want to think about for the future. Um, working with students who need to build typing skills. So there's a lot of support for beginner learners in the OPD. But you might want to look at um, some literacy support. Um, okay, so I know we have five minutes left, um, but let's see what questions. There are many questions left. Anything else? Um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining. This has been really, uh, exceed, this has really exceeded my expectations because the basis for what I wanted to do was pretend we were lesson planning. And I was blown away at how great the uh, ideas were um, and how creative you guys are, all of you are. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you all. Everyone stay safe. Take care. And like we've said, we're going to keep working towards the goal for our learners, um, helping those learners, even though we're facing some challenges. The goal doesn't change. We just have to manage our expectations and figure out how we get there. So I think uh, we're going to have the survey in a second. Everyone, please join for the next session. Um, it's going to be really exciting information, especially for everyone who's joining from abroad. We're going to go over the Oxford Online Placement Test and the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionaries. Or I shouldn't say abroad. Everyone is joining from around the world. Um, okay. Josedek or Catherine? Hey, uh, Harcourt, thank you very much. It was very helpful. Um, and thank you for all the information that you gave us. Um, I have to, to tell you that uh, I learned a lot more about the Oxford Picture Dictionary. I, I know it for a while now, but lots of new things happening with this edition. Thank you very much. Lots